So we're making this video to help show the perspectives that have shaped the uh, messaging uh, position for XR UK and the recommendations that we're making with regards to how we want to relate to uh, COP26 this year in Glasgow. Uh, we've got a political circle who think deeply about these things and they've listened to the perspectives of young people whose hopes often get raised and then dashed by these, uh, these panels of so-called leaders, right? We've listened to our reparations experts and those with direct relationships with those communities most affected in the majority world. And we've also had legal professions, uh, you know, professionals with long term experience and knowledge of this COP process. And those uh, folks have seen this as a long term failed attempt to address the climate and ecological emergency. And that's not to say there aren't uh, great people that go to some of these COP processes and try their best, right? We're one family and we're not trying to divide from everybody here. Um, there's a document link below this YouTube, which you, will give you more information and references. And I guess where I'm coming from is what we do in the, in the run up to COP and during and afterwards, it's, it's more about building our movement, the scale and the strength of the movement, the connections across the world. This emergency is uh, getting worse. It's going to escalate. As the years go by, we're heading in the direction of authoritarianism, uh, food shortages and so on. We need to strategize together and plan for post-COP and get stronger and stronger as a movement as uh, things are naturally going to unravel. So listening to uh, these experts to speak about the COP. Uh, my name is Adetola Stephanie Onomade and I'm a member of the Global Majority versus the UK government campaign. Uh, I've been involved with some uh, youth groups such as XR Youth Solidarity. Um, so this year, uh, the UK government will be hosting the Conference of Parties or COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, as a member of the Global Majority, who's, uh, who's part of the diaspora, so the majority of my family being in the Global South, uh, in the Caribbean and on the continent of Africa, um, where the UK has historically played a large role in the extractivism and uh, yeah, in the extractivism and corruption that has, takes place in these countries. Um, I, in this process of COP26, there's very little faith in the those who have been elected to uh, set set out this process because they have met in private, the Conservative Party have met in private uh, with fossil fuel companies um, and have given millions of pounds, they have given millions of pounds to the Conservative Party in the last 10 years. The fact they've met nine times uh, more with fossil fuel com companies than with renewable energy companies and have spent over, they have spent over one billion pounds misleading the public on climate related issues. And the UK government is aware of this, yet it calls itself a climate leader when the real climate leaders are in the global majority, in the global south, where they are resisting extractivism. And this process does not um, allow people to resist uh, further. It leads to more climate inaction from the global north and those most responsible for these issues. So, hi, I'm Tim Crosland. I was previously a government lawyer. Um, I now spend most of my time either suing the government or being prosecuted by the government with the climate litigation charity plan B. So the main purpose of um, the COP process is to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. It's COP26 now because we've had 25 years of COPs before it. The reason the objective is to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, well we've seen that partly over the summer, even in the global north, um, the, the heat dome in North America and Canada, those rows of prostrate people in cooling centres, uh, the infernos around the Mediterranean, whole villages being decimated in Germany and, and France, just with 1.2 degrees, the sort of impacts that we've seen in the global south for, for decades and decades. The science predicts that beyond 1.5 degrees, whole regions of the world will become uninhabitable because the wet bulb temperature will pass uh, 35 degrees Celsius beyond the capacity of the human body to cool itself down. 
the risks of multiple cereal breadbasket failure will rise uh, very substantially, um, jeopardizing food security, meaning people may not be able to put food on the table. So that's why that figure was agreed on. My name is Chris. I'm a youth activist in Newcastle and I'm 20 years old. Decades of denial, inaction and exponential increases in our carbon emissions have led us to this point. In the face of the existential threat of our generation, the best our governments can offer us is lies and betrayal. Despite the Greenwash Climate Accords and conferences, we've emitted more carbon since governments have been meeting to address the climate crisis than in the entirety of human history beforehand. Our government's committed to try and keep global warming under 1.5 degrees six years ago. Rich countries promised to provide $100 billion a year by 2020 to support decarbonise sustainable development in poor countries. These were just barefaced lies. Since then, governments across the world have spent more subsidising fossil fuels than they have on policies to meet their commitments, using taxpayers' money to fund the destruction of our very future. Our governments are not just failing to protect our future, they're actively decimating it. COP26 marks the moment of uh, a terrible political failure, the greatest political failure in our history. It's now clear that limit will not be maintained. The limit government set themselves, and according to their own evidence, what the IPCC had said was for a fair chance of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees, global emissions would have to go down uh, by 45% by 2030. In fact, uh, the latest analysis is they're going to go up 16% by 2030. It's important to be honest about that, not to be depressed about it, but as James Baldwin says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. It's only when we face up to this failure. Hi, my name's George. I'm from the Expo UK Political Circle. One of the most powerful industries the world has ever known has been capturing governments across the world um, for, for decades, and it's been capturing the media stories that we get told about climate change. It's responsible for thousands of articles saying that, you know, the lights will go off if we don't keep burning fossil fuels. So where are we now? 26 years into the COP process, um, we're at a stage of catastrophic greenwashing. All the governments have signed up to the rhetoric that says we need to keep to 1.5 degrees. Um, and quite simply, at current rates of emissions, the world has six to 13 years um, before we hit 1.5 degrees. Um, and the UK, because we, we are one of the countries that has caused the problem, need to cut faster than the poor countries. So we have between two and six years of our current emissions to meet 1.5 degrees. And meanwhile, the world is being told 2015, keeping 1.5 in sight, it is quite simply a lie. And it's a lie perpetrated by putting so-called negative emissions onto future generations. So we've literally just put carry on planning to carry on burning oil and gas for, for decades to come. And we're just saying that in the future, we're gonna somehow suck this stuff out of the atmosphere. Meanwhile, hundreds of millions of people are suffering. Over five million people are dying because of the carbon economy every single year. Um, and in any other circumstance where powerful actors are making decisions which knowingly cause the death of millions of people a year, we would call that mass murder. This is why we call it a crime against humanity. This collective failure is a crime against humanity. It's a crime against youth, it's a crime against future generations, and it's a crime against those already feeling the effects of climate breakdown. The governments that will meet at COP26 under the guise of inspiring climate action, their words, not mine, are the biggest threat humanity faces. We have the science, we have the tools, and we have the motivation to prevent further environmental and ecological collapse. But instead, we're sleepwalking off a cliff, accelerating towards oblivion. Instead, it's young people who will pay the price. It's us who have to live with the lack of decision making by our so called leaders. The lack of decision making taking place at greenwashing summits like COP26. If these are the leaders that took us into this crisis, how can we put our trust in them to see us out of it? We quite simply need a, a fair global conference of the people and not a corrupted conference of parties. We need people from across the world to come to the table and come up with sensible decisions about how we address this in a way that will help everybody reach a, a, a decent flourishing future and prevent the destruction of life as we know it. Um, yeah, and, and this is mainly about rich countries. They're responsible for 92% of the excess emissions in the atmosphere. So when we're told what about China, it is the UK, the US, the countries that have been burning fossil fuels for hundreds of years that need to fund the transformation 
across the world. That means paying for the leapfrogging of poor countries from from um, brown energy to green. Um, and you know we have a 90 trillion dollar a year global economy. We need to stump up a few trillion to actually pay for that transformation that gives our, our kids a chance for the future. Um, we've stumped up trillions for the for the financial crisis for COVID. We can do it for for a distant future. Um, and yet, yeah, quite simply, an adequate response to this crisis, given that at current rates we're likely to hit 1.5 by 2030, we should be doing everything we can to, to hit global net zero by 2030, with the rich countries paying paying for the damage that they've caused. Um, and that would mean like a wartime style mobilization. The IPCC said we need rapid, far reaching, unprecedented changes to every aspect of society. And despite the rhetoric, nothing like that is on the table in the UK that calls itself a climate leader or anywhere else. And this is why COP is set to be a catastrophic failure. Um, but not because we couldn't do it otherwise. The human race has the capacity like never before to transform the way the world does business and create a beautiful, flourishing future for all. Um, but it is not happening. And unless it happens now, things are only going to get worse and worse. Quite simply, nothing like what is required is on the table at COP. Um, and instead, we have a narrative of success, which is really clear. They're going to call it a success if they get lots more countries to sign a bit of paper, essentially saying we're going to be net zero by 2050. And it means nothing in terms of what is actually happening to, to the planet. Um, they're also going to say we have a, we're going to get 100 billion dollars into an account. Um, a, that's a fraction of what is required to, to pay for the damage and the transformation, but B, it can even be loans. So we're talking about countries getting hammered by climate change and then going to more debt. Um, we must stand up against this process. Exile Scotland have called for as many people as possible to come and support their actions there. And we have to disrupt this cop, this, this crazy business as usual, and tell an inspiring story about what the truth of our situation actually is. I am Esther Stamford Cossey, and I am a co founder of Extinction Rebellion Internationalist Solidarity Network. We share the widespread viewpoint common within Global South communities of resistance, that such top-down processes like the COP only result in greenwashing that facilitates the growing threat of eco-fascism. By not seeking to resolve the crux of the matter of the worldwide climate and ecological crisis and the genocide and ecocide of extractivism. For this reason, we are not prepared as peoples to wait any longer on change from the top and are already creating alternatives from the ground up. True to our own XRISM mandate, we need to truthfully amplify voices of the global majority that are creating the alternatives to failed processes like the COP. There is the imperative for us to do so because of our XRISM strategy, which tries to actualize the principles enshrined in what internationalist solidarity means, that is connecting the liberation efforts of peoples and not encouraging the paternalistic attitude of saviorism, which ends up being the coloniality of white saviorism. Our XRISM strategy is about glocalization to interconnect communities of resistance in both the global south and the global north to work closer together as the global majority on unifying their people's power and strengthening it in multicultural and intercultural engagements of co-liberation actions of Planet Repairs Rebellion. So this rebellion is not just about rebellion against extractivism and its perpetrators, but rather change-making actions that seek to stop the harm being done through the genocide and ecocide crimes of the worldwide climate and ecological crisis, and galvanize internationalist solidarity in shutting down ecocide crimes of extractivist plunder in order to effect and secure holistic societal and ecological repairs for transformative adaptation that will enable all life forms to thrive in balance with our mother earth.